many years ago, having lost my wife on our first visit to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, she goes around art galleries much more slowly than I do. I backtracked to see if I could find her and eventually saw her standing, gazing at Bonnard's The Breakfast Room. And when I appeared at her shoulder, she said, I could live with that. So I, without her knowing, bought a poster, brought it home, and since then it has been framed in our flat. Until recently, after a considerable time lapse, recently I saw, or imagined I saw in it for the first time, a little peripheral female figure on the left-hand side of the canvas. That sparked off a realisation that a poem was bubbling up. It was a short poem addressed to the painting. A few nights later, unpremeditated, a second section, her response, materialised, and after a slightly longer period, Bonnard himself put his oar in. Subsequently, I did some reading and discovered that without being fully able to understand or take on board the, the whole principle of, of long and short light waves, I got the impression that his use in many of his other paintings, particularly of oranges and yellows, meant that these colours were particularly visible during the day in bright light, and that the mauves, the violets in the periphery of this painting come into their own in the evening twilight. And given his own statement that he tended to put important figures at the periphery of his paintings, I like to think that my belated discovery of her tallied with what his intention had been as an artist whose work I love. The paintings on the wall, the poem is in, as I say, three short sections in three voices. The Breakfast Room. That poster has been on my wall for years. The other night, a woman appeared in it, a nondescript figure, more a housekeeper than the wife whom the bohemian in him painted in her bathtub over and over down the decades. Holding a cup, the other arm slack, she merges with the curtain's muted tones, a balustrade, shady garden beyond. Waif-like, half her body out with the frame, she seems almost spectral, as if dissolving, or part of a transformation scene. I'd gladly join her, brioche and baguettes to share, tea in the pot, a chair easily drawn up. But unlikely, given her forlorn stare. Not once has there been the prelude to an invitation, or the least indication she has noticed me. Two. Whether the artist's wife or his chatelaine, why in heaven's name would I invite you in? You scarcely endear yourself by dismissing me as some drab, that or a moody phantom. While I make no claim to beauty, a little sensitivity wouldn't come amiss. Can be hard enough dispelling the notions of those who ogle my husband's nude studies on me. As to not noticing you, quite the reverse. I'm far too aware of your presence. My room lit at all hours while you pursue your obsession. Loud music putting an end, albeit temporarily, to my tranquillity. But between marginality and impermanence, lies a fine distinction. Whichever of us you believe to be the fiction, I'll look out long after you've stopped looking in. And three, you find my mat unobtrusive. For a spell she was so self-effacing, whenever I wanted to paint her, she would hide behind the curtains. In one portrait, not dissimilar to this, she virtually disappears. Here, simultaneously concealed and revealed, she blends in perfectly. 
Small compensation for what she has undergone, illness held in abeyance by immersion in water. Hence my depictions of her as Venus emerging, the light casting a spell on her skin as it was when I first met her. A vision of young love preserved, my palette imbues her with the blue violet of memory. No need to choose between smelling the scent and plucking the flower. Painting her has been like bottling a rare spirit. Now, if you'll excuse me, 